Okay, we're going to explore something rather curious tonight. It may take more than uh, one evening. I'd like to get into Jung's idea of the dialectic. But to do that, I'm first going to look at Plato's divided line. Now you might ask why, if we're going to talk about the dialectic and Jung's approach to the dialectic, why are we going to introduce it with an exploration of Plato's divided line? Well, that's because in Carl Jung's great work on alchemy, Plato's divided line plays a pivotal role. Now, what's interesting about Carl Jung, and let me make a statement about it to begin with, Jung has a problem with Plato, a very fundamental problem and I'm going to see whether or not I can throw some light on that. And perhaps when I throw it, it'll be sufficient to have an impact, to keep the metaphor going. Now, what's significant about Plato's divided line? Plato's divided line is in Plato's Republic, book six. He says, the greatest task is to learn the perfect model of the good. And if you don't learn it, then even though you know what is beautiful, even beauty itself, and justice, it won't do you much good unless you understand the perfect model of the good. That's his claim. Matter of fact, he goes on to say, if you learn everything else, and this of course deals with the Republic, and if you fail to grasp the significance of this perfect model of the good, won't do you any good to learn all the rest? So what is this perfect model of the good? Let's just go right into it. And after I do it, I'm then going to distribute a copy of Carl Jung's understanding of the divided line, and we can play one against the other. Now, primarily, in Platonic thought, the ultimate, the highest term, is the good, also called the one. Now, there is said to be an offspring of the good, or the one. That's the term he uses, it's an offspring. The offspring of the good is called the idea of the good. Now, we must use that word idea in its formal sense. Right? In the Greek, that's an idea. That means to behold. It's not a concept. It's a great mistake to consider it a concept. Because when you behold the good as an object, right, then you experience the following things necessarily. Right? Beauty itself. The nature of being. Nature of being means that which is ultimately real, that which eternally is. that which has within it both power and vitality. Often said to power, vitality. Now, the offspring of the, of the offspring of the good, which we, see this is a Greek word, idea is a Greek word, which means to behold. Therefore, the offspring of the good, that to behold it, to behold the good, is this. Now, 
the relationship between these two is an analogy, Plato says. It is an analogy. And I'll read you a quite beautiful section in a short while. Now, what does that mean? That means the good stands to the offspring of the good as an analogy. What's the complete analogy? Well, he has, therefore, this very interesting construction called the divided line, which is based upon the golden section. Golden section is that geometric profit, property where a line is cut in, cut in such a way that the greater to the lesser stands to one another as an incommensurable. There is no common measure between them. And uh, it's a very interesting property which is recursive. But let's take a look. All right? Let's see if we can build it. Take a line. Cut it in a greater and a lesser. That is cutting it as what is called a golden section. That's phi in mathematics. Right, that's phi. And that's a ratio of 1 to uh, uh, 0.6108, etc. Right. Now, this larger part stands to mind. as the lesser stands to the visible world. Then each of these two sections is cut again in the same ratio, in the same ratio, as A is to C, as C is to D, so that there's a greater and a lesser here, and the same way there's a greater and lesser here. What's significant about cutting a line in this way is that these two sections then mathematically are considered equal. And that's one of the great values of constructing an analogy from a golden section. That has great significance later. Now, that's the divided line. Now, what does he say about it? He says, over the visible realm there is the sun. And so it is the source of generation, nurture, and development. In the same way, over the intelligible, or what is sometimes called mind, there stands the good. Pardon me, the idea of the good. Well, right here. How can we indicate that? We'll just, just say right. the idea of the good, as we just described it. Now, the idea of the good, another way of looking at that, is sometimes called the, uh, uh, the lumine uh, natural, the, the, the natural luminosity. This is divine radiance. Uh, experienced as divine radiance. Uh, luminosity, divine luminosity. And in that experience, one discovers, therefore, that the nature of reality is far, far greater in such an experience when contrasted to the visible world. This is the phenomenal world. This is the phenomenal world, the world of appearances. This is the way our everyday world appears to us, this world. And therefore, it, it can be said to have a division. And the division between it is the realm of belief and image thinking. These are all cognitive functions. The greater part of this is knowledge, knowing. This is understanding. Now, these are the four cognitive functions of man. Right? When you're talking about the way in which man functions, he has four cognitive functions. For Plato, each one of these is not just an arbitrary distinction because each one of these is said to have its own particular power. See? Each one is said to have its own particular power in a gradiating, in a uh, decreasing sense. The greatest being knowing, understanding, belief, and finally image thinking. Each one has a power and therefore with that power, it can know a particular kind of object which is only possible to be known
from that particular way because each one of these is a way of apprehending what we call our loosely call our, our world experience. Therefore, look here, this is the world of sight. This is the world of sight. This is the visible world. But what we look at when we see the world is heavily influenced by the set of beliefs which, in, which causes us to think this higher than that, this greater than that, this less than this. And therefore, we then, on the basis of that, form all kinds of image thinking. And that's image thinking. Now, understanding has its appropriate objects. Knowing has its appropriate objects. Now, I would love to read this beautiful section of Plato. It's one of my favorite ones. And uh, let's see what he says about it, and I'll add to it. I'm in the sixth book. For you have often heard that the greatest task is to learn the perfect model of the good. The use of which makes all just things and other such become useful and helpful. That's its value. When you understand this, then you can see how these things can be said to be useful. All right? Useful and valuable. Helpful. And now you know pretty well that I'm going to talk about he says, and, and uh, now you know pretty well that I'm about to speak of this and to say besides that we do not know the model sufficiently. But if we don't know it, you know it will not be of any advantage to us to understand all the rest perfectly without the model. Just as it is no advantage to possess anything without the good, do you suppose there's any gain in possessing everything in the world without possessing the good? Or to understand everything in the world except the good? To understand nothing of the beautiful and the good? This model allows us to do what he calls understand this experience, this experience, and as a consequence we should then be able to look at this and see that it, we, we can then understand it it can then become helpful to us, and it can be of use to us. But unless we can put it and understand it in this model, he says, very unlikely, if not impossible. Now, if it is, uh, if it is unknown in what way just things and beautiful things are good, these things will not have gained a guardian of themselves worth, worth much. And, when, and, and one who does not know this himself, I prophesize that no one will really understand them satisfactorily before he does. That's a very interesting quote. Let me do it again. Watch. I didn't put the accent in the right syllable or word. That if it is unknown in what way just things and beautiful things are good, these things will not have gained a guardian of themselves worth much in one who does not know this himself. And I prophesize that no one will understand them satisfactorily before he does. Therefore, that's the primary object of knowledge. Now, I'm going to uh, skip for a short section. Uh, I'm not reading consecutively, of course. The offspring of the good, the offspring of the good, which the good begat, is in relationship to the good itself an analogy. And what the good affects by its influence in the region of mind towards mind and things thought, so the, fun, so the sun affects in the visible realm for things seen and, and uh, sight itself. So that's exactly this. And what the good affects by its influence in the region of mind, towards mind, towards mind, and things of the mind, so the sun, correspondingly, and the phenomenal world, 
And this is an image of the phenomenal world, as well as cognitive functions, because cognitive functions follow from sight to making judgments about the phenomenal world, as the faculty of news allows us to understand and experience this other realm. Understand, then, that it is the same with the, with the soul. Now, now we're going to the soul. Here it is. When it settles itself firmly in that region in which truth and real being brightly shines, it understands, knows, and it appears to have reason. Therefore, when the soul firmly settles itself in here, right? there's a picture of the soul, right? When, when the soul fixes itself. Understand that in the same way with the soul. When it settles itself firmly in that region in which truth and real being brightly shine, it understands, knows it, and appears to have reason. It, it isn't, by the way, the word reason isn't there. That's noose. That's this faculty. The faculty for knowing is noose. That's the highest faculty of the mind capable of intuit intuiting the nature of ultimate reality. So therefore, it appears to have news. It doesn't have it. It participates in it. And of course, when it has nothing to rest upon, then it mingles itself with darkness and it becomes uh, into what becomes and perishes. That's this world of appearance. Things appear and disappear. The world of becoming is then it, just, it only opines. Now, let me go further, OK? So from this state, then, resting itself in this realm, in the divided line, right? that's the part we want to look at, because I want to make several points about it so we can then push the analogy. So when it finds itself firmly in that region in which truth and real being brightly shine, it understands, knows, and appears to have reason. Then that which provides their truth to the things known and gives the power of knowing to the knower, you must say is the principle of the idea of the good, the idea or principle of the good. That's the source of it. That's the source of it. What gives then the knower the power of knowing and its ability to grasp and sustain itself in truth, that is this, the idea of the good. That's the source. That's the source. Now he has a beautiful paragraph. It's one of the, one of the most beautiful paragraphs in Plato, I think. Then that which provides their truth to the things known and gives the power of knowing to the knower, you must say is the idea or the principle of the good. And you must conceive it as being the cause of understanding Dianoia and truth, insofar as is known. And thus, while knowledge and truth as we know them are beautiful, you will be right in thinking that it is something different and something still more beautiful than these. As for knowledge and truth, just as we said before that it was right to consider light and sight to be sun-like, but wrong to think of them to be the sun. So in this very way, it's right to consider both of these to be good-like, but wrong to consider them to be the good. Because the good is far above the idea of the good. The sun, now he makes the analogy on this side, watch, and then he's going to move over here. This stands to this. The sun stands to the idea of the good. The idea of the good is the source of luminosity and divine radiance into this realm as the sun is in the visible realm. The sun provides not only the power of being seen for things seen, but as I think you will agree, also their generation, their growth and nurture. That's right. That's what the sun does here. Although it, it, it's not itself generation. Similarly with things known. Now he's going to stay on this side of the analogy. On things known, 
you will agree that the good is not only the cause of their being known and the cause the cause of being the cause of being see the cause of being because this is the offspring of the good and that's what this is and therefore this isn't the good but it's the cause of it oh, pardon me the good is the cause of being and so um, literally it's the cause it is the cause that they are the cause of their state of being although the good is not itself a state of being but far beyond it in both dignity and power so then they ask him Socrates this is so complex they say you must make it you must make it so that we can see it even better and he says, okay I'll do it I'll finish the comparison with the Sun yes I'll do it I'll finish the comparison with the Sun and then he then details this divided line. That's his goal, and that's the divided line. It's a magnificent kind of construction in which there's a key place for the dialectic. Let me talk about the dialectic here in Plato. What is the problem with philosophy in Plato? What is the biggest problem? Why was the, the Republic written? The Republic was written, according to Plato, in the, in the six, seven books, as well as the ninth book, for one specific purpose, many people reach this state. They behold a divine radiance, luminosity. They experience the nature of beauty itself and being. There is, it is not possible to be in this state and think that there is anything higher. It is not conceivable it's not conceivable that anything could be more beautiful than this. It's not possible that anything can have more power and mindfulness than this. Therefore, there are many traditions that take this as the ultimate term. What Plato is saying is, wait a minute now. That's merely the offspring of the good. The good is something far beyond it in dignity and power. Therefore, what do you do with people who experience this and strive for it in every way? For Plato, that's the dialectic. To be able to use the dialectic to bring someone who's experienced this and thinks this is ultimate through and dialectical exploration so they can see it is not what they think it is, but there is that which is higher beyond it. That's the function of the dialectic. And how he does it is quite remarkable, but <clears throat> right now, that's what I want to say. Now, look here. Uh, I would like to move into Carl Jung for a minute or two, and through the magic of Xerox. Pass these two back, please. If you just get over to one page, go to the back. This all comes out of Carl Jung's. Okay. On page 250, <clears throat> Carl Jung <coughs> needs a structure in which to see all his alchemy function. And so what he does is he goes to Dorn, who's a very famous alchemist, and draw Dorn, I'm on page 248, Dorn draws a complete parallel between the alchemical work and the moral intellectual transformation of man. This is the moral intellectual transformation of man. That's what it's doing. That's what it does. It's an intellectual transformation of man. It's an intellectual, and of course, it's moral in a different sense than we normally mean it, but we'll use his language for the moment without correcting it, right? It's an intellectual, moral transformation of man. 
Dorn draws a complete parallel between the alchemical work and the moral intellectual transformation of man. The thought, however, is often anticipated in the Haranite treatise on Platonic Tratologies. This is the Platonic Tratologies. Tratologies is just a fancy word for four. The study of the ology of the four tetralogies. This is the four. This is the divided line. The Latin title is the Libra Platonis Quartorum. The Plato, the book of Plato's four, say Quartorum. Right, that's where it is. That's what this is. Its author presents four series of correspondences, each containing four books for the help of the investigator. So now, here on page 250, 251, he is now going to explore the divided line. Now look here, let me point out something rather curious to this. When he does this, Carl Jung ignores, totally ignores everything we have here on the board except this. That's all he does. He doesn't bring in all that I've said that comes out of Plato. He totally ignores it. That's very interesting. That is very interesting. Now, I got you the whole thing in this section, and it's eminently worth looking at because you can see that certain of the key terms are here. Let's take a look at the fourth. This is the fourth, knowing, on page 252. The fourth vertical series, the column is exclusively psychological. The senses mediate perception, while the discrete intellectualis corresponds to apperception. This activity is subject to the ratio of animal, anima rationalis. What is that? That's the highest faculty bestowed, on, bestowed by God on man. That is the vehicle through which then man sees. Here it is, right? That's the faculty. Now he quotes Plato. He, plo he quotes Plato, <laughs> Platonus Quartorum. He interprets the rest, which is mind, as the invisible and immovable God whose will created the intelligence from the will and intelligence to be understood here as the intellectus is produced the simple soul. But the soul gives rise to the discriminated natures from which the composite natures are produced and these show that a thing cannot be comprehended save by something superior to it. The soul is above nature and through it, and through it nature is comprehended but the intelligence is above the soul and through it the soul is comprehended and the intelligence is comprehended by that which is above itself but is surrounded by the one God whose nature is not to be comprehended. What did he just say as I ran through it so fast? He's trying to explain this fourth section. This is the quote he's using. Right? That that's the intellect. That's what we call the intellect. That's the translation for this word noose. It's that faculty which is given by God to man. It's something superior, right? It's something superior to all the predecessors. The soul is above nature. Man is not part of nature. He's above nature. And through it, nature is comprehended. But the intelligence is above the soul. And through it, the soul is comprehended. And the intelligence is comprehended by that which is above the itself. Look here. You know what that is? Let's put it down and take a look at it. Right. Here we are. Let's put it right here. Look at the structure we have. Nature. That's the phenomenal world. Soul. Soul comprehends nature. The intelligence which is above the soul comprehends soul.
and the intelligence is comprehended that which is above itself and is surrounded by the one, the one God. But God is not comprehended. That's pure Platonism. That's pure Platonism. The one, intelligence, soul, nature. Well, usually takes this form. You can put it diagrammatically. One, or the good, it, it overflows, as it were, in Plotinus's language because it is, of a, of, it is inherently fruitful, inherently it overflows, inherently it is productive of life. Its first production, therefore, is intelligence, divine intelligence. There's a corresponding overflowing of that to soul, and after that there is soul and body, which is sometimes called nature. Plato. Now, it is very interesting that here we have it, and then he gives it in Latin at 253, 254. And again, I'd like to draw your attention to he's going to pick up this theme. On page 255, but I'll just get you to it. This strange idea uh, uh, that the old philosophers, he, uh, he said, the, old, the philosopher didn't realize they were projecting their, their, their psychic contents into their struggles. And whether that's true or not, I'll let go. But right now, I want to go back to Dorn and the much earlier, earlier work we're interested in, which is the Libra Platonis Quatorum, which is on 255. Both Dorn and the much earlier Libra Platonis Quartorum demanded that the operator should rise to the height of his task. He must accomplish in his own self the same process that he attributes to matter, for things are perfected by their like. Pure 100% Plato Plotinus. Therefore, the operator must himself participate in the work. For if the investigator does not remotely possess the likeness to the work, he will not climb the height I've described nor reach the road that leads to the goal. Oh. Let me ask, this is all Plato. Plato, Plato, Plato. It's even in the Latin, Plato, Plato, Plato. He doesn't tell us. Why doesn't he tell us it's Plato? He wants to say it's hermetic. Look here. He wants to say it is hermetic. That's what he wants to say. He wants to say it's hermetic, hermetic. It's all hermetic. But what is hermetic? That's what we need to do. We need to take a look at what is hermetic. Um, I want to go to another section, but let me just... Uh, Take a look at what he means by these things. I have a couple of quotes here from other works of Carl Jung's. Right. With the triumph of Christianity under Emperor Constantine, the old pagan ideas didn't vanish, but lived on in that strange arcane terminology of philosophical alchemy. Pagan, of course, is just the word for people who lived in the countryside. Those are the people who held on to their old beliefs. That's Plato. That's the Neoplatonic tradition. That's the Platonic tradition. So what is he saying? He said, you know what? All of these ideas, they went underground, and that's the origin of, of alchemy. Alchemy has a spiritual side, which must not be underestimated by... and and whose psychological value has not yet been sufficiently appreciated. Right? We cannot under underestimate the, the spiritual side of alchemy and its psychological value has not been sufficiently uh, understood and uh, appreciated. Look here. Uh, take a look at this. Now, this is where I want to go. This is what Carl Jung says of himself. I can hardly draw a veil over the fact that we psychotherapists ought really to be philosophers or philosophical doctors. 
I can hardly draw a veil over the fact that we psychotherapists ought really to be philosophers or philosophic doctors, or rather we are already are so, though we're unwilling to admit it because of the glaring contrast between our work and what passes for philosophy in the universities. Hey, he's a philosopher then. This is all philosophy. Alchemy is philosophy. That's rather curious. Why did it take the hermetic form? Why did it take the hermetic form? Because that's what he says over and over again. Well, um, I now have, and you notice I'm not answering that for a while. Let's see if we can look through the mental attitude towards the work of alchemy and see whether or not it comes out to be pure 100% Platonic thought or Neoplatonic philosophy. That's all. So I made a couple of things here. These are all basic ideas in Platonic thought, so we can appreciate them. Nothing we haven't said for a moment. Illumination. That's the I. This is the offspring of the idea of the good, that divine radiance, that luminosity that some people experience in the highest peak experiences in their lives. Right? The tree of philosophy is nothing other than man. Man, man is a, the tree, uh, sometimes called the anthropos. Right? But the real goal is that the man has to become one himself. And in order to become one himself, according to Platonic thought, that means you have to go through a discipline to make yourself one. That is expressed very clearly in Plato in his definition of justice in the fourth book of Plato's Republic, as well as other places, but clearly there. How do you do it? You have to turn your mind upon itself. That's what you have to do. You have to pull away from the phenomenal world and devote your mind to trying to understand the nature of the mind. You have to turn the mind upon itself. That's called, in the great language of Greek thought, usia. Right? Uh, Turning the mind, that ability of the mind to turn upon itself takes on this word, which is sometimes translated as essence. But that's what it means. To, the mind's ability to reflect upon itself and say, who am I? What am I? What am I doing? What's the nature of mind? That's the function of reflecting back and turning the mind upon itself. How do you do it? You have to study philosophy. The old philosophers, that's what you have to do because that's their primary subject. Among the philosophers, one of the most major ones, of course, is the writings of Parmenides, Plato's Parmenides, and Parmenides himself. What must you do? There isn't any other way. Study, 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 study. Go over it again and again, a hundred times. The Chinese have one of the greatest expressions of learning. You can understand any book if you've read it a hundred times. Then what must you do? You then meditate on the words, the key concepts. And most especially, you have to then grasp the idea that the intellect itself has neither a beginning, middle, or end. Therefore, you have to become involved in a reflective campaign, to, uh, an exercise direct called meditation. And to do that it requires an act of imagination, which I'll say a few words about in Plato. And uh, one of the things that they object, objects that are meditation can be something as beautiful as this. And as all things proceed from the one, through the meditation of the one, right? that's a great expression, right? as all things proceed from the one, through the meditation on the one, so man becomes a one. That, therefore, then to go from this experience of luminosity to this is the primary task of the dialectic. Now, what do you do when you do that kind of meditation? Two things. You have to express what you see you have to express what you think. You have to amplify it so it can be clear to yourself. That's called amplification. You have to see the underlining analogies for all of these constructions. Therefore, amplification and analogy are the key elements for understanding philosophy. Now, I put hermetic in here for a reason. Now, that's just a quick view of philosophy. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. But I happen to have brought with me a couple of pieces of paper, which I gave to you. And here we go. As you take a look at 243, 
please, uh, I must apologize for the fact that I made notes in the book and for many years, and uh, I tried to get a clean copy to copy, but I wasn't able to. Um, I should have anticipated it, but I didn't. Okay, look here, on page 243. I pray you, look with the eyes of the mind at the little tree of, of the grain of wheat regarding all its circumstances so that we may bring the tree of the philosophers to grow. All right. Dorn says, in the Philosophica Medic Med uh, Meditiva, which is philosophical meditation, out of other things that thou will never make the one until thou hast first become one thyself. That's right, become one thyself. That's right out of Plato's book four of the, the uh, Republic. Whatever the alchemist may mean by the one, it must refer to the artist whose unity is postulated as the absolute condition for the completion of the work. Rosarium Philosophicum says, that's another work on philosophy, the Rosarium, for the, the, very clearly. Who therefore knows the salt and its solution, knows the hidden secret of the wise men of old. Therefore, turn your mind upon the salt, for it alone, the mind, salt is mind. That's the way they talk about it. Salt is the mind. It's, this, it, it's the, it, uh, the key element in alchemy. Therefore, turn your mind upon the salt, for it alone, the mind, is the science concealed and the most excellent and the most hidden secret of all ancient philosophers. Well, then how are you going to do it? Well, mind and salt, mind and salt are close cousins. They're, they're one exchange is for the other. That's the salt of the earth. Uh, Kumrath Kum says, therefore direct your feelings, senses, reason, and thoughts upon the salt alone. The author of Rosarian Philosophica says, with true and not false imagination, and again, that the stone will be found when the search lies heavy on the searcher. Well, how are you going to do that? I'm on page 246. The essential secret of the whole art lies, of course, hidden in the human mind. Therefore, how are we going to get to it? I'm now on the next quote. Therefore, all those who desire to attain the blessing of this art should apply themselves to study, should gather the truth from the books and not from invented fables and untruthful works. There is no way by which this art can, be, can truly be found except by completing their studies and understanding the words of the philosophers. Bernard of Trevisio tells us how, to, how he struggled in vain for many years till at last he was led into the right path through his sermon by Parmenides and the Turba. What are they going to go to Parmenides? Hey, hey, that's right, they're going to Parmenides. For every one of these points, there's going to be a corresponding point. He should collect the books of different authors because otherwise it's impossible to understand them. And he should not throw aside a book which he has read once, twice, or even three times, although he has not understood it, but he should read it again 10, 20, 50 times, or even more. At last he will see wherein the authors are mainly agreed and where the truth lies. Lully, another great authority in alchemy, says, you know what you have to do? You have to accomplish the work and you're not going to be do that until you've studied universal philosophy. Therefore, the stone belongs not to the vulgar, but to the very heart of our philosophy. And what kind of study? The study of the books of the old philosophers. Right. I'm on 248. One must, right? The alchemist then applies himself to the serious study of the literature, read diligently, meditated upon day and night, until his finances were exhausted. Then he worked in his laboratory, saw the three colors appear, and on Easter day of the following year, a wonderful thing happened. He saw the perfect fulfillment. And of course, this is that, uh, I skipped it, I shouldn't skip it because it's such a lovely thing. Uh, um, uh, this is Dionysus Zacharias. Okay. Now, let's go further into the quotes. 
Um, I'm going to skip what Carl Jung says. I'm just going to go for the quotes as I've been doing. Turn back, brethren, to the way of truth of which you are ignorant. I counsel you for your own sake to study and to labor with steadfast meditation on the words of the philosophers whence the truth can be summoned forth. Now look here. What, what are we doing? We're going right through this. Now look at the way Jung summarizes it. Right. 248. The importance of the necessity of understanding using the mind and intelligence is insisted upon all through the literature. Not only because intelligence above the ordinary is needed in the performance of so difficult a work, but because it is assumed that a species of magical power capable of transforming even the brute matter, brute matter dwells in the human mind. Right? In truth, the form, which is the intellect of man, is the beginning, middle, and end of the process. I'm on the... Dorn draws a complete parallel between the alchemical work and the moral intellectual transformation of man. His thought, however, is often anticipated in the Haranai treatise of Platonic Tratologies, the Latin title, which is Libra Platonis Quatorium. Its author presents four series of correspondences, and that brings us into what we've been engaged in, which is the divided line. Now, What is most interesting is that when you look at the source for this work, this great thing that he quotes is the divided line, the Platonic, Libra Platonis Tratologies, he quotes a work, and I'm going to his source, called the Theatrum Kenicum. It was a five-volume work, six-volume work actually, uh, uh, in three volumes. That was printed in 1613 to 1661. In this work on section uh, eight is that great quote of Bernard of Trevisio where he argues that you should go into Parmenides. And um, on the section on 28, in the same work, Libra Platonis Quartorium. He quotes it, it comes out of that same work, the Theatrum Chemicum. This work has never been translated. There are no copies of it outside of the original. Uh, it is, there's no facsimile copy made of it. Carl Jung has been around for over 70 years. The key work of his is, the key work which he regards as central to al alchemy. He didn't take the trouble of pointing out that it's Platonic. He didn't take the trouble to point out that all of this is play found in Plato's Republic. He didn't in any way instruct us that behind all of those names, the word philosopher and philosophy is spelt out and left in the Latin. He has a conflict over philosophy. He has a genuine conflict over philosophy. Now, he knew Plato. There's no doubt about it. He quotes Plato tw uh, a bunch of times. If you look up the index, you can see it. In every case, you'll find that Jung never treats Plato fully. He never treats Plotinus fully. He never mentions Proclus. He, but he knew them. He doesn't include them. He doesn't go through these explorations. He says, alchemy, and I don't know whether I brought the other book, but I can quote it for you. He says, Alchemy comes out of hermetic philosophy. Look here, hermetic philosophy, in terms of time, is a very curious system. In Europe, hermetic philosophy was treated as, as so significant in the Christian faith and by the church fathers, St. Augustine, uh, Lactanius, the early fathers of the church saw hermetic literature, Hermes, as paralleling sacred scriptures. They thought Hermes, of course, is trice, trice great Hermes is uh, Tresmagedius. They saw him and believed he was contemporary with Moses 
And therefore, they took that whole hermetic tradition, which they thought was at the same time of Moses, and therefore they thought that Hermes in his writings anticipated much of Christian thought, and therefore in the Middle Ages, the basic writings of the hermetic philosophy came into existence with Ficino. Ficino is the most important figure in all of this thought because he is the man who mastered Greek so thoroughly that he translated all of Plato, Aristotle, all the major writings into Latin in the 15th century. There are no, there are no alchemical works before Ficino, Ficino translated the hermetic literature. All of the literature on alchemy, its beginning and its end coincided with the great hope that people had in Europe that when the hermetic literature came out and was published, they would find a way of using their mind to know the nature of the divine, approved and still within the church. Now, let me pass around something which I have here. All right. This is a chart of all the alchemical works printed. And all those in Latin printed. There are 4,675 works of alchemy. I have a list of all of them, by the way, in case you want them. You can see when they came in. You can see where they ended. They died out in the 18th century. Why do they die out in the 18th century? Let's hold that for a moment and ask a couple of questions. What is it to say, when people talk about the Hermetic philosophy, therefore, they talk about a set of writings which primarily include one great writing called Poimandries, which, if you can get a chance, you should read. Magnet, very beautiful piece of writing. They thought it was contemporaneous with Moses. They saw it as something esoteric, prophetic, revelatory, that would allow man to be initiated into higher mysteries. They saw it as a way in which mind could be used to reach the nature of God. They saw that the Logos was the Son of God. That's what they called the Son of God, right? The Logos. And as a consequence of that, they were akin to mind and exploring the mind in this system. This allowed, this allowed the uh, hermetic tradition to stand along with Christianity, and many points were similar to it, until something happened in the 1800s. And at that point, it died out. And again, I don't know why Carl Jung didn't put it in, because it's quite simple. Isaiah Kasubandu, in the 18th century, took a look at this story and he said, excuse me, gentlemen, I can show you that the literature called Hermetic literature, Hermes, could not have come into existence before the second, third century of the Common Era. He showed that. He said, this is a myth. It's a lovely myth, but it's false. And therefore, St. Augustine and Lactanius and other people at that time were simply mistaken. Hermes did not live at the same time as Moses. There's nothing sacred about this literature. It was part of the movement that was going on at the time. And then he therefore demonstrated something very interesting to us, which is that the Hermetic philosophy really has its origin in, and it can be traced directly, since the second and third centuries are very clear about this, to Hellenistic literature. Hellenistic means the literature that was written in Greek after the Alexander the Great as it extended itself into the Near East. And therefore that Greek thought is Platonic, called Middle Platonism. It's called Middle Platonism. It has a spiritual basis that Middle Platonism, therefore, entered into this region, especially Egypt and that area, especially in Alexandria, 
and it fused, therefore, because there's something about Hermetic literature that's different than Christianity, and that is they have the twofold view of good and bad, good and evil, as opposing forces. Therefore, it's dualistic. And of course, that's what makes it separate and distinct and ties it back to what was going on among the Egyptians themselves. Therefore, what do we know today? We know that Hermes was in fact a set of writings that occurred in the third, second, third century. The early Christian fathers thought it was ancient, thought it was living, he was living at the same time as Moses, therefore authentic and revelatory. But uh, Isaiah Casabandu showed that in the 18th century, 1800s, pardon me, uh, that this was in principle false and that that entire literature therefore could be called pseudo-epigraphical, which means it was written by many authors under the disguised name of Hermes and therefore it was pawned off as real but it was really a forgery. That ended, that ended the Hermetic tradition as a sacred special religious movement in Europe. Again, hey, it can still have value I mean, of course it can have value, independent of whether or not people thought it was contemporaneous with Moses. It still has a solid philosophical root from the Hellenistic period. Now, still too. that's right. Pardon me? Still foreshadowed. Uh, yes, yeah. Yeah. But since it was then declared to be forgeries and uh, what they call pseudo-epigraphical, which means the other people put their names, uh, writers put the name of Hermes on it to make believe it was really ancient and it wasn't. So therefore that ended the legitimate, the re legitimate form of hermetic literature in Europe. If they don't want it, we can. We can take it. Carl Jung then explores this entire thing of the psychological side to hermetic literature as it reveals itself in alchemy, and that's what he did with his books. But he fails to point out a couple of things. While I would like to go into Carl Jung's use of the dialectic, but I think I ran out of time, and I'll do that as soon as I can. So, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, I'd like to pull this back now. So, um, we need to look at the dialectic in Carl Jung. That comes out of four basic works, and we'll tie that in with alchemy. Uh, but I could just, I tried to work as fast as I could, but I couldn't get into it. Um, I think he's quite right in saying that alchemy is a spiritual, has a spiritual side, which shouldn't be underestimated. It also has psychological value that hasn't been sufficiently understood. Right. And my point here is that he is heavily involved in philosophy. Would you not agree the quotes I've organized show that it, has a heavily, it is heavily philosophy. It's heavily of the kind of philosophy which we recognize as Platonic, Hermetic Platonic philosophy. And therefore, I don't understand why Carl Jung, therefore, doesn't say, yes, I am a philosopher. I've been interested in philosophy. And maybe that's what psychoanalysts should get into is philosophy. Thank you. Question. I, uh, yeah. I didn't understand. These quotes come from alchemical studies or, or study about where these verses come from. The religious, religion. All of this comes from psychology and alchemy of Carl Jung. Is that Jones. something he wrote? Yeah. Years, yeah. 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 I don't understand. Yes, this is what he wrote. But then he's making. I, a matter of fact, I, I, I don't have an autographed copy, but there it is. Okay, I, I was just wondering about what you're saying that he didn't reach the level of understanding where these platonic thought, but yet he's making many quotes or, or referring to many quotes here. So I'm, I don't understand what you're saying. Yes, you do understand what I'm saying. You have the same riddle. You don't understand if he's mentioning this so often, then why doesn't he recognize that he's, he's deeply into philosophy? 
It would be like uh, talking about uh, a Mustang, but never saying it was built by Ford. That's right. That's right. And it keeps you know, calling it a Mustang. Yeah, it's a Mustang, but it doesn't mention it's Ford. It wasn't made or designed by Ford. No. It's just a Mustang. Yeah. But how did he get away with going back to it being uh, in a Hellenistic time and middle Platonist without saying it was Platonist? Why doesn't he say it? I totally agree with him. Why does he say it's Hermetic? See, the first quote he says here, it's clearly, it's clearly not. See? See, Hermetic is second century. That's 700 years after this event. No, uh, 700 years from its origin. Constantine is 300. Right? So he's saying, under the tribe of Christianity at 300 AD, the old pagan ideas didn't vanish. They lived on in the strange terminology of philosophical alchemy. Like, Went like, underground. It's like saying, meanwhile, back at the ranch, three hundred years later. <laughs> it'll be 500 years later. Okay. See, what would happen if he were to say, look, I am a philosopher, right? That's what he calls himself. Well, that, then he'd be a, a notch down from Freud. At the time, they had that great. Oh, that great split. Yeah. Yeah. And he said, "Well, you know, yeah. I'm not really a psychoanalyst. I'm a philosopher." He'd be cutting his own throat. He would be. He would be. Yeah. This is the way he can. Be, this is the way he can do philosophy. In the guise of religion. In the guise of psychoanalysis and religion, disguising it as uh, keeping the disguise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Keeping his billable efforts. Yeah. Now, I can show you sometime, it would be worth any, it's, it's an easy paper to write, anybody can write it. Just go to Carl Jung, look up the index, look at all the quotes to Plato, uh, trace them down, and you'll see he never unpacks anything Plato ever said. Never. And the quotes that he does use are often footnotes and they're minor points, and he doesn't in any way credit him with anything. But he seems to have a strain to build himself. And he knows scaffolding backwards using Neoplatonist thought because he also was very interested in the Gnostic uh, papers. Yeah. And Th that's he right. Bought, he, he put up the money to buy them. He bought the Gnostic papers. That's mm -hmm. right. And it was like that's he was right. building the structure, but he never finished it. And never he, for some strange reason, and I maybe a psychoanalyst should explore it, if, uh, if the Platonic tradition is his father, he has got a problem with his father. And he's got a name for that. Mm -hmm. He can't recognize his father. He can't recognize. Yeah. But is it not curious that here, in a very straightforward quote, this is all, of course, right out of Jung, uh, Principles and Practices of Psychotherapy, page 79, there it is, that's the source for it. I can hardly draw a veil over the fact that we psychotherapists ought really to be philosophers. We're un we're, the reason is that we're unwilling to admit it because of the strange, the uh, glaring contrast because what we do, we do in philosophy is university. So what? That's only because in the universities they don't study this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I'll wait for a, a quick time and maybe we can shift one of these other lectures around because I'd like to get into the dialectic and compare Plato's dialectic with Carl Jung, and uh, ran out of time. What would be the comparisons between Jung, the dialectic, and the Kabbalah, do you think? Well, um, the way to get into the Kabbalah uh, is, is it's, it's a very straightforward way. Um, the key to all of the capitalistic systems is Plato's dialogue called the Parmenides. Mm -hmm. all right. He has nine hypotheses and one of Zeno's, or ten altogether. That's sphere of life, tree of life. That seems That's it. Uh, and uh, the relationship between it. And equally well, the Chaldean oracles. Mm -hmm. yeah. Remember, the Chaldean Oracles is structured in such a way to represent that, and many people see the equivalence between the Chaldean and the uh, Kabbalistic. It's one-to-one. -one. And again, that has its origin in Platonic thought. And also, the, some of the 
Some of the Jung's writing is there too, it's just kind yeah. of hidden. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, there's, there are a lot of uh, people in the Kabbalah that don't like the fact that it can be traced back to Platonic thought. There's a whole hostility against Plato in Europe. Oh, yeah, we I kept, mean, they just take them out and beat them up. That's what they do. We kept coming out yesterday. We were looking at a book at Barnes & Noble, and we were looking at the word Kabbalah was mentioned in the big thick book with the we were going, oh, we'll go, we, this book, uh, lecture, you know, that we had about it, and it was in the Jewish section. All these people who are very serious were looking at it. It's like we were some sort of infinite, or even suggesting it would have mm -hmm. somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Try. Try. Well, thank you. Thank you.